Good morning, Sofa Squad. It's me, Paul, reporting live from my sofa. How's everybody doing today? We are looking at a new trial that's going on. Uh, before we get started, though, I just want to say I am starting to get a cold, so I apologize. I have got sleepy bedhead hat on, and uh, I'm a little bit stopped up today, so I apologize in advance. Uh, don't forget, look down in the description below. There's links to the new channels that I have, so be sure to check those out. Um, one of them's for the podcast, and another one's like kind of like pop culture type stuff. It's a variety of things if you have interest. Other than true crime, you might want to check it out. I appreciate it in advance. Now, before we get started, I also want to say, uh, keep in mind, I'm not the end-all be-all on this case. All I'm doing is offering my opinions. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not any kind of person in the judicial system. I'm not a judge or anything like that. So these are just my opinions. I'm watching these cases along with y'all and just kind of doing a review and recap on it and offering my opinion. So I welcome comments down in the comment section. Drop it like it's hot. And uh, that's it. So let's go ahead and let's get started. So again, this is the Florida versus Rogers trial, and we're going to be reviewing day one today in this video. Now, obviously, with all these cases, the first thing that happens are opening statements. And the state goes first in this case, and I just want to say, before we get into like what they actually said and stuff, because I feel like a lot of people were saying this, and myself included, where it was like, oh my gosh, this is torture. You know, <laughs> there definitely was this kind of snoozer effect for the opening statements. You know, today was just kind of a boring day in testimony. You know, I felt like the state was a little bit rambling at times, and I felt like the defense was a little bit timid maybe, maybe shy or whatever. So I'm not them. I don't know what it's like to be standing up there and having a line of cameras facing me. I don't know if it's the first time they've done high profile stuff like this or whatever, but you know, I agree. Also because this is death penalty, they are, as we would hope, going to dot their I's and cross their T's in this. So a lot of times it just becomes, you know, like, oh my gosh. So, but I, I feel the pain out there. I did, y'all. Because I was re-watching this on, you know, like, times two or whatever. And I was just like, will it end? Will it ever end? So, anyways, that being said, let's go. So, now the state gets up there and essentially they're saying, look, this case is about the perfect marriage, the perfect friendship, the perfect murder. So the first thing that the state does is they get up there and they outline the day of the events. And I'm speaking on like June 28th, that whole little weekend or whatever, but June 28th specifically. June 28th, June 29th. So the state gets up there and they're saying, you know, look, you know, Dr. Seavers had show, gone home early from their vacation. She had, you know, not shown up the next day at work. And so obviously, you know, this alarmed her staff. They were like, what's going on? They start trying to reach out to people. They eventually have to call Mark Seavers, her husband. Mr. Seavers in turn calls Dr. Petritus who is essentially a friend of Miss Stevers and his, but more Miss Stevers. And he's like, look, I'm out of town. I can't get a hold of her. You know, will you please go to the house and check on her? Now, we're going to hear more from him in a little bit to give context, because this is very odd to him on multiple levels. But for right now, with the state going over it, you know, this is just part of the timeline. So Dr. Petritus, you know, eventually does this, goes over to the house. He is the one that discovers her lifeless body in the kitchen. And so he contacts authorities and goes from there. Now, the next thing that the state wants to outline is actual investigation, obviously. Now, they talk about how hard it was to find leads, and, you know, basically, just like you hear in these crimes where it's like, look, you know, there was, like, all this money in the house, electronics, you know, this house wasn't ransacked. I mean, it was a little bit messy, but it wasn't like, there's no signs of a robbery, basically. So all these typical things they're looking for just weren't there. Now, the state then does discuss about the break that they finally got, which came from Missouri. So when the detectives went to Missouri to follow this lead, this is when everything starts clicking and it just starts falling into place and the lead goes to this lead to this lead to this lead all the way to the suspects Curtis Wright and Jimmy Rogers. Now the state begins to outline their evidence against Mr. Rogers and they talk about how the investigators went to his home to interview him and how you know he denied all the I don't know Mark Seavers I've never been you know I didn't go to Florida and this would be proven to be false because Rogers had met Mark Seavers like in 2015 at Curtis Wright's marriage and at his wedding. And Rogers was there with his girlfriend Taylor, who she will play a very pivotal role 
here in a little bit. Now, not only do they start finding this out, but they have evidence to back this stuff up with. You know, the state has photographic evidence of Rogers at the wedding. You know, they have video surveillance of Rogers at gas stations all the way down to Florida. Uh, and even the sheriff's office downloaded video footage from, guess what? Hold on, wait for it, from the local Walmart. As usual, there's always gotta be a Walmart involved in these cases. Walmart is going to go down as single-handedly taking down half the criminal population in the United States, y'all. I mean, it just is. Even if you're thinking about speeding, don't do it near Walmart. They will get you. They will get you. But they have footage of Curtis Wright and Jimmy Rogers shopping at, you know, at the area of Walmart, which is not good. Now, the state also talks about other evidence from, like, uh, phone messages that correspond to them being involved. And also the state says that Mark Severs even confided to Curtis Wright that he didn't want to lose his children in a divorce. And that he talks about a hypothetical situation of needing to get rid of a wife. Now just days after the murder, Curtis Wright comes back down to Florida for the funeral of Teresa. Now eventually, investigators will take the, the Gammon GPS from the rental car, and they will figure out that not only has this car gone to Florida for the funeral, but it also went to Florida and back right beforehand, so they can kind of trace him and find out that this rental company, oh, wait a second, look, this isn't the only time he rented a car here. He did just the other day. And so you start to see how this evidence just adds up of something shady, especially, you know, nobody's ever gone to Florida, but well, hey, look, we have all this GPS evidence. So technology plays a big role in this case. Now they also say that while they were in the car doing this trip, that the GPS, the Garmin, connected to an email, which was Jimmy Rogers. Now another big thing that's gonna take place in this case is witness testimony, people flipping. And we already know that Curtis Wright's gonna do this, but also the girlfriend, Taylor, is going to be doing this. So the state begins to outline how they're going to utilize Taylor, the former girlfriend, to testify against Rogers. Now, Taylor was originally present when investigators talked to Rogers and he denied going to Florida. And so a little bit after that interview, she started getting really nervous and like, hey, something's not adding up. And so she contacted the police again to have a conversation with them. She stated that not only was Rogers out of town when he said that he wasn't, but that soon after they came to talk to him, he soaked his cell phone in water and then destroyed it. Then also, he asked her to go to his work with him. Now, the type of work that he was in it involved like disposing of lead and things like this. So the state's saying that not only would he be very versed in how to clean up stuff like, like a crime scene, but that also they had to wear these like blue suits. These kind of like, it sounded like, it's like these full body suits or whatever. And they're going to find evidence of these and Taylor's going to be testifying about this. So she said that she went to, drove to his work with him. And at some point he had her throw out the window the destroyed cell phone as well as one of these blue suits. The state says that eventually what takes place is that Taylor leads him back to where these suits were and sure enough they find this evidence and they're going to find trace evidence on these suits, fibers, hair, things of this nature, that tie them in to the crime. Now clearly all of this evidence, it leads to the arrest of Rogers and he's charged with the murder of Teresa. So now when detectives went to jail to talk to Rogers, they said that basically he was like, look, Missouri, second degree murder charge in Missouri, that's like 15 to 20 years, not a problem, see you later, bye bye. So obviously that doesn't look good. Now the state then begins to outline how Curtis Wright struck a deal and that, you know, and they, they say, you know, yes, he's a murderer, we get it, we have to work with him to get the other people. And so they're like, yeah, he has a deal, he got 25 years in prison, and they're like, you know what, but at his age, that means he might not ever walk out of prison. And I mean, let's be honest, we know that that to be true. But, you know, essentially they always have to kind of do this thing of like, look, yeah, we might have had to make a deal with the devil, but it's important for us to get everybody involved in the crime. And, you know, amongst other things, they're like, he's going to testify to like, you know, these conversations that he had with Mr. Seavers in regards to getting rid of the wife and things of this nature. So he's going to play a pivotal role. Now, what the state calls this is a lying conspiracy. So you got Seavers to write to Rogers. And they say that this is known in legality terms as a lying conspiracy. Now, the state then goes into details about, you know, kind of what they allege happened on that day. And so they say that on the weekend of the 27th, that Wright picked up Rogers, who he brought along, you know, this a uh, couple of his blue work suits, 
uh, some gloves, things of this nature, and they made the drive from Missouri all the way down to Florida. Now, the state outlines this whole scene where they were, like, hiding out in the garage and the house and, you know, basically waiting around for her. And essentially, she kind of came home a little bit earlier, and one of them had, like, jump and hide real quick and so when she walked in it was like you know garages have you park in the garage and there's usually a door obviously going into your home so she went into that door and one of them followed her into the house and when he was going he like kicked the dog in the dog dish or something like that and it made her turn around and look you know she saw him and that's when the bludgeoning began and I mean, it's just awful. I mean, I just can't imagine the horror she had to have felt in those last few moments of her life. I mean, just, it's absolutely heinous. And I mean, it was a brutal beating. Brutal. This was not a, oh, we're going to get paid, let's kill her and go. I mean, there was, this was savage. Now, the defense gets up to do their opening statements. And again, you know, I, I just felt like she was very timid, very, you know, self aware, maybe. Uh, kind of stumbled over her words some. Again, I don't know how many cameras are in that room. I don't know what it's like to do that. So I get it. I mean, I would be nervous doing it too. So, you know, I get it. So she gets up there and essentially is painting the story of, look, the state hasn't told you everything. You know, there's way more to this story than meets the eye. And essentially, like anybody, they're like, we want you to hear all the evidence before you make your mind up. This, the defense also says, look, you, yeah, you're going to hear from people like Curtis Wright, Taylor, people like this. But we want you to look at what their motivation is. Look at all sides of the the, the issue before you make your mind up. Now, one thing the defense is doing is they're trying to essentially paint it like, look, you know, Rogers, yeah, yeah Rogers did this. Almost like owning up to part of the, the, the alleged events. Like, yeah, he went to Florida, but look, he wasn't trying to hide his phone. He, he didn't get a burner phone. He brought a regular phone with him. He called his boss and told him he was going to Florida. You know, things of this nature. You know, they say that Mr. Wright never even mentioned Rogers to Mr. Seavers. So they're trying to, you know, pivot this kind of like, well, maybe he was there, but he didn't have part to do in this. Now, when it comes to testimony like Taylor, the, the girlfriend, you know, they basically are like, look, her statements were inconsistent. And the defense is claiming that she's received money from the police and still is receiving money. Uh, I believe that she received money for like a rental deposit, rent. Uh, they said that she was paying, getting paid like 400 bucks a month and still is getting paid by the sheriff's department. And essentially that she was eligible for like up to 50 grand for testimony. So if that is true, and I mean, not just because that's a big statement to make. Remember, these are opening statements. People can say kind of what they want to, but I want to see the evidence. So if she is getting paid all this money, part of me is like, was it a witness protection type situation? Because that's a different story, you know, because it's a whole other thing. You know, look at some of these other cases we've studied, such as the West Memphis, when they put these huge amounts of money out there for, oh, you have information and it motivates people to lie and make things up. So, essentially, that's what the, the defense is getting at with this. So, the defense was not up there that long, and then we quickly move on to the first witness. Now, the first witness is going to actually be Teresa's older sister, Anne. Uh, she's from Connecticut. She's the older sister. She describes Teresa as the love of her life. Her biggest reason to be on the stand, besides, you know, obviously being the sister, talking about how much she cared about Teresa, is to paint the picture of that weekend and what was going on. So she describes a weekend from June 26th to June 28th where her, her family, Teresa, Mark, their kids, they were all up in New York at their, her mother's house celebrating, like, I think it was her mother's birthday from the past, but it was just, it was a big family event. And so they talk about how Teresa Lisa, you know, did she went back home early and Mark stayed behind with the girls and they stayed at Teresa's mother's house. Now they say that the next time that Mark went home is once he received the news about Teresa and then they have her, she holds a picture up of her sister and, you know, again, that was basically her testimony. Now the next witness is a, an employee or former employee of Dr. Teresa Cybers from her clinic. And this is Sandra, she's a medical assistant. She's worked with her for about seven years. And essentially her testimony is to get up there and paint the picture of the morning that Teresa never showed up, just to show like, yeah, this is completely out of character. You know, we're first patients at nine, she's always there early. You know, Teresa sounded like a real person, you know, on it. And so she talks about how, yes, yeah, she didn't show up, so we tried calling her, we couldn't get a hold of her. So she eventually ends up calling Mark, and they establish that essentially Mark is like the office manager or something like that, because she says that that's her boss too. And that basically she calls Mark saying, look, you know, she's not here, what's going on, we need to find her. Now the next person to get on the stand is Dr. Petritus. Remember, he was the one that 
we heard in the opening statements, he's the one who found Teresa's body. So he gets up there, and all they're doing is connecting the dots. So, you know, Sandra calls Mark Seavers. Mark Seavers eventually calls Dr. Petritus. And Dr. Petritus has known Teresa for years since he was, like, doing his residency. And essentially he paints a picture like he and his wife were friends with Teresa more so than they were Mark. Like, they were close with Teresa, but not so much Mark. He was more like an acquaintance. And a lot of times that can happen that way in a couple, you know. But to me it was a little bit odd how he talked about Mark to where it was almost like, Okay, does there, was there a personal issue with him, or you just had a longer friendship? So it just sounds like their connection to the Seavers family was through Teresa. But Mark calls her. He's like, look, I can't get a hold of her. One odd thing that he tells him is that he's like, I've, I've tracked her cell phone to the house, but also he's saying that her cell phone's turned off. So there's something weird going on there with that. But essentially he's like saying, you know, look, will you go to the house? And, you know, Petritus was kind of like, okay, you know, this struck him as odd. And so he's talking, like, I'm pulling up to the house, I'm on the phone, and Mark's like, go in the house, go in the house. And he was very uncomfortable with this. Because you know how it is, the last thing you're expecting is that you're going to find your friend dead on the floor. You know, so he's like, look, we were comfortable, but we didn't know each other like that. Like, I wasn't going to just walk into her house. You know, he said, number one, you know, what if she's, you know, taking a bath? What if she's, you know, just sitting there having breakfast and I scare her? And and also, you know, they had guns and he doesn't want to get killed himself. All very logical things. So basically he says that Mark is like, look, here's the code to the garage. Just go in the garage. He opens the garage door. He says that the dogs that he could see through the window, like at the front door foyer, then come running out, which signifies, hey, the door, house door is open. He said both the cars are there. The dogs come running out. And he says he starts to go in. He's calling her name. Obviously, nobody's answering. And he notices the door is open, so it's a little odd. And he sees, I believe, the hammer first with some hair on it. Then he sees blood and then Teresa's body. And, you know, basically he's like, look, you know, being a doctor, I could take one look at her. And it, well, at first, I shouldn't say that. At first he said, I thought that, like, she was hanging a picture or maybe she fell. But very quickly he was like, Ugh, you know, like her head was bashed in, basically. And so he was like, you know, she, she was not alive. So he called first responders, you know, went outside the house, called first responders. And that leads us to the next witness. So Lieutenant Adam Hughes is one of the first responders. He's the lieutenant for the rescue and he was basically one of the first people in the house and he was up there for a very short amount of time he's like yeah we went in the house these is equipment we bring in with us uh we could take one look at her and the, her injuries were inconsistent with life and so he's like basically in situations like that we turn around we go right back out like there's no trying to revive it's obvious this person's dead and we wait for police so the last witness of the day that was on the stand forever was kimberly a crime scene tech and she gets up there, and this was very tedious, but it's necessary to have this type of testimony, obviously. So she's a crime scene tech. She spent four days at the house photographing literally every single thing and part of this home, inside and out, evidence, you name it. So she spends the rest of the day in the stand. Now, she spends a large amount of time in the beginning talking about essentially the methods used at the scene for documenting, collecting, and preserving evidence. Now then she talks about how, you know, she photographed the house inside and out. Now next they start getting into some of the crime scene photos. And again, there's tons of these photos, but major ones that stuck out were like the door, how some of the door, like the damage to the door being opened, uh, the hammer with the money on it, with hammer with the money on it, the hammer with the hair on it. Uh, now they also show, and this is just to establish that there was tons of reasons if somebody was breaking into the home to steal things, then it didn't happen. So, you know, they're showing the, there was a big water container with like money in it, money on the counter, you know, things of this nature, you know, electronics, stuff like this. That was just, if this was a robbery, it was obvious that these things would have been taken. Now, some of these crime scene photos do show Teresa, and at one point they flash over to Rogers, and it's always interesting to try and get a reaction off of the, you know, the alleged. And he just kind of has this deadpan look on his face. Of, of course he would. We don't expect anything less. I mean, what's he going to do? Break down and start crying and say, I did it. You know, it's no. Now, next after they do this, they have Kimberly come to like, well, basically a big bulletin board that they have done the layout of the house. And she's then going through and basically saying, yes, this crime scene photo goes here. This one goes here. And kind of visually showing the jury what she did. Now, the next thing they do is they have Kimberly back on the stand and the state is going through and having her take evidence out 
and talk about that. Well, the first thing is the hammer. Now, it's always a surreal moment when the, the murder weapon, the alleged murder weapon, is brought out and shown because you're just like... Oof. If that's what killed her, it's just, it's for me, it's always just, it gives me goosebumps right now. So they show that. They go over all this different evidence. Now, at one point, they do come up to, hold your breath, the Walmart receipts. And, you know, whenever they do this, I mean, I don't know, I already said it in this video, but I'm just like, why? Why? So <laughs> they talk about the Walmart receipts, and there's just, you know, four of them they had for this, and three of them were at, like, the local Walmart, and one of them was from Missouri. So... You know, all this stuff's going to be used in evidence in the trial and whatnot. Now, other points of interest that she talked about is that they found some, like, in the shredder at the house, uh, they found some uh, evidence that looked like it was from a life insurance company, which is going to be a big part of this later on. Uh, also, they found a safe that had, like, one, it was a locked safe, but they found, like, $50,000 in it. So, again, it's big for them to show, like, look, this was not, you know, this was a hitman-type murder. This was not where breaking into the house and stealing money because these people had tons of stuff to steal so when the defense gets up there to cross her and they weren't up there you know thank goodness they established that yeah there was fifty thousand dollars in the house that wasn't taken and that also there was no dna on the hammer that related back to rogers so which is you know very telling or whatever so i have to get into because even if that's the case you know so a lot of the other evidence just doesn't look good it definitely looks like it ties them him to it but we need to see direct evidence of like we need his dna on something you know that proves that because for me a lot of times these cases even though it might look so obvious you just can't go with like what your feeling is it's like they have to prove it and because you know too many times we see this take place where it's like oh this is obvious and then it turns out where no it wasn't you know it just happened to look like it so anyways that was the day's events. This is going to be interesting to follow. I think that we've gotten some of the boring stuff out of the way. And we're going to get more into like the, I hate to say like juicy details. But, you know, just some more testimony that's not as dry. You know, hopefully. So, anyways, I appreciate you just in here hanging out with me, listening to me. Uh, again, check out the description below if you want some links to my other channels and things like that. Uh, I do have other interests besides true crime. And so I'm trying to explore those. Uh, anyways, I hope everybody has a great Friday, a great weekend, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.